Welcome to Sardar TV, I'm Vaishali Jain. We're excited to have Dr. Riaz Kadem join us today. Dr. Kadem is CEO and founder of consulting firm InfoTrack, and he's author of the book called Total Alignment, a book to help leaders transform and streamline their organizations, and he's here to tell us more. Dr. Kadem, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, happy to be here. So tell us why you decided to write the book. Well, um, maybe I should take me out of the picture and tell you why was the book written. So it's a little bit different, different angle. Because there are so many um, circumstances that actually happened in the way we, we uh, learned so much in the field while helping clients and uh, the way we met our uh, literary agent and how this all <laughs> really evolved into getting the book here. So why was the book written? Well, you know, uh, we see in organizations uh, so much time wasted, um, either for people working across purposes, uh, uh, people arguing, um, people acting without thinking, people uh, thinking without acting, <laughs> people doing things and not reflecting afterwards. So the whole list of things that happen in organizations. And, uh, uh, and so that wastage of energy and time of people really need to be addressed. And so really the root cause of it is alignment, lack of alignment in the organization. So really this book really needed to, to be written and come out. So that's, that's what I would say it is. Now, what's next? Would you say that we can expect something else like this in the future, another well, book like this? Yeah, as you know, the topic is so vast, total alignment is so vast, and has so many elements. So I'm sure in each element there's a lot more uh, deeper thinking that uh, would need to come and be written. So this is really a small contribution to, uh, to this field. Tell us the reason for your success and some of the factors that you feel have contributed to that, that our viewers can benefit from? Well, um, really the, uh, what, what has emerged uh, that you see in the book really comes from experiences with clients and that we have served over many years in both US and Europe and in uh, Central South America. So, uh, I would say the reason is um, an attitude of learning, to learn what, what we saw in the field, to try it and see what worked and what needed to be adjusted in order to address the misalignment that happens in many organizations. So getting into your book now, start off by telling us about the concept of alignment. Well, uh, we say that alignment is something that um, happens in the organization when, when the forces, and the energies, the thinking, the actions of people uh, are directed towards one thing. Now that one thing is really to advance the vision of the organization. You may think of it uh, um, in terms of um, uh, maybe an analogy of uh, the sun shines on the, on the piece of glass and the rays are pretty much parallel after a little bit of deflection. Uh, but then if that glass is convex and, and uh, it, it will focus the energies of the sun into one single point and that point will burn. So in a way, aligning the energies of the organization in order to achieve a purpose, a vision, that is something that's very valuable. Uh, without it, then it would be much more difficult. You also talk about misalignment in organizations. So you've just mentioned what alignment is. What would misalignment be then? Mm, well, misalignment is when you, when, when obviously when you don't have alignment, but you could look at some signs in your organization when there is apathy, uh, when there is a lack of motivation, uh, when there are too many meetings and people are going all over and meeting without really getting much result and people are not working uh, collaboratively, whether silos in the organization, 
uh, when uh, responsibilities are not very clear as to who makes, uh, who should do what, when decision making is not clear as to who makes the decision. Th these are some, some uh, symptoms uh, that of misalignment. What conditions need to be present in, f in order for alignment to exist? Well, you know, the, for that, uh, there, 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 you can look at it in two ways. One is um, the structure of the organization should encourage alignment. And it's not so in many, many companies. Uh, you got salaries that are misaligned. Uh, you have uh, uh, meetings and, and spaces where uh, it doesn't encourage alignment. There happens in different departments instead of together. So there are some structural uh, changes that need, need to be made in an organization to encourage alignment, or at least to take the barriers away from being aligned. Uh, and then the second thing is that um, uh, even when you have those structures, then there is really a cultural issue of how people would need to act, how people need to relate to each other, how people need to problem solve together. Uh, that uh, is a cultural piece. And the combination of the two is what will help uh, to have uh, alignment, total alignment. You also introduce uh, an alignment mm -hmm. assessment in the book and you lay out some categories mm -hmm. for that. Can you go through what that assessment is and what the categories are? We've introduced uh, an alignment assessment uh, that has seven categories. One is focus and direction. It's basically how people are focused with the vision and with the strategy of the organization. Uh, and the second category is execution of uh, the strategy. A vertical alignment across, you know, along the levels. Uh, horizontal alignment across the functions, uh, alignment of uh, behaviors with, with values in the company, alignment of competencies uh, with uh, what you need to do, your work, and alignment of compensation uh, with contribution. So these are seven categories. And in the book, we just gave one question per category to make it kind of quick and simple for any person, any CEO or any person to look at their organization and say, well, how do we score from zero to 10 on each of these categories? And then uh, we can produce a, maybe a radar chart to see the extent of alignment. Uh, but on our website, we have a, you know, a more detailed assessment with uh, these se same seven categories with five questions for each, which is a little more thorough. Uh, assessment. And so any uh, company can go through this and de determine to what extent they're aligned. One struggle that every leadership team faces is aligning the entire organization behind its vision and its mission. Tell us what some of the most effective characteristics of a mission statement are. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, really, the, the main characteristic that should be there is that it should inspire people. I don't care how long it is, how short it is, what it says. If it really gets you to do uh, something to promote that, that purpose, that's a good mission statement. Can you give us an example of an organization that you consider has a good and effective mission statement? Well, that's a, again, it's not me considering, it's really the employees considering. Because you know you can look up from the outside and say oh, it's a great mission statement. It may not inspire anybody, but just as an example, you have uh, Google saying that their mission is to organize the information for the world. <laughs> if I was working for Google, I think I think that would inspire me, but I don't know. I'm not working for Google, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I can't tell if that's really an excellent mission statement or not. And for example, Uber said mm, uh, that uh, they want to transportation to be like running water anywhere. So, I mean, the only judge would be the people who are actually are inspired by that mission. A mission should really state what the company is doing and why. And it's the why that would be inspi inspirational. So when you work with organizations on mission statements, how do you ask them to approach it? Well, we, uh, we give them some categories for them to be thinking about, and then we get them to 
uh, to involve their, uh, their team to arrive at something that's meaningful to them. That does uh, include what the business they're in, why, and where. Uh, so that's kind of the basic aspects. Okay. Tell us the purpose of the vision statement and what the differences are. The vision statement uh, really uh, sets a goal for the organization. It's really a picture of the, of the success in the future. And, um, uh, and that should also be inspiring uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to struggle to get the, the mission established. And in those times, you really need something inspirational. This is where we're going. This is, this is the goal. Uh, so that's really uh, the, the, the purpose is to provide a goal for the whole organization to achieve uh, three years, five years, 10 years, even 20 years out. Of course, with the changes that are happening in the environment, uh, it'd be uh, difficult to think uh, 20 years ahead, but, but why not? And can you give us an example of an organization that you think or you feel the employees <laughs> might think have an effective a vision statement? Yeah. In the book, I, I also mentioned um, Google. Uh, their vision st uh, statement is really with one click, access of information with one click. Uh, that kind of puts a picture of how that mission statement, which was organizing the world information and now it's played out that you know at anywhere in the world with one click you access uh, that information um, so I mean the, the basically the two are related because the mission is what you want to do and why you want to do it and the vision is how far you want to go how far do you see your success uh, in the future and again what are some things that leaders should be doing in order to create or craft that vision statement? The key is to involve people. So it's not a vision of the CEO, but it's a vision of uh, a group of people who come together, exchange ideas. Uh, for vision, you really need to be looking at technology, uh, trends in the market, and what is possible uh, for your organization to achieve in the given period of time. So uh, I, again, I'd say, I'd say involving people. How do you go about measuring the quality of your vision and mission, mission statements? As I said, the criteria for, is how much it inspires and motivates people. Uh, a measurement of quality could be uh, through maybe a survey that you can do to see how that uh, uh, the criteria is met. Any indicators that leaders should be looking at to track the progress of their vision? Definitely, I think um, uh, once, once you have a, mission, a vision statement, then uh, you could break it down into its components and then reflect of how do I know if we have achieved that vision, that, that element of the vision? How do, we, how do we measure it? What numbers do we look at? And that a question will lead you to some progress indicators uh, that uh, definitely they need to be based on hard data. And, and so between different alternatives, you pick the alternative where you have data or you can easily get data to, uh, to see if you have achieved that, that intent of the vision. So we encourage our clients, once they have crafted a good vision statement, to then go through the process of, of this analysis and thinking to come up with indicators, progress indicators. Can you give us an example of what some of those progress indicators might be or have been for perhaps a client that you've worked with? Yeah, okay, maybe not mentioning the, the particular clients. For example, on the financial side, it could be economic value added, we could measure uh, you know, the value that uh, a company is creating in terms of the market uh, participation would be the market share, percent market share, of maybe the main product. Uh, these, these are also some key performance indicators that companies have 
Uh, but what we do is we want to be sure that these key performance indicators uh, are aligned with the vision and that you don't have so many of them that are there just on their own without being aligned. So it's a process of align alignment of your measurements uh, with, the, with the vision. So then how do you handle the challenges of having multiple business units when you're trying to align their strategies to the overall strategy of the organization? And you know, organizations are, are of different sizes, from small to very large. So let me start with very large, <laughs> then we can talk about the small ones too. Uh, for, the, for the very large ones, uh, usually they have different business units uh, within a, a larger company. And each of the business units has different clients and they have different competitors. And, and so their, their strategy needs to be uh, determined, it needs to be defined by the business unit leaders um, in, and, and the executive team with the help of uh, industry experts. Uh, so um, there needs to be an alignment between each level with the next level up. For example, if there is a business unit that, is, that happens to be in a, uh, in a low attractive market and it's not doing very well compared to its competitors, uh, even though the business unit team would like to grow aggressively, uh, maybe that's not the best <laughs> strategy. And so a level higher would not allow them to do that because maybe the, what they should do is to ra really exit the market rather than grow it. So at these different levels, at each level, you have to think of a strategy to be aligned with the uh, next level up. And so in the book, we talk about uh, the, the level above to provide a strategic direction for the uh, next level down and also a, st uh, a mandate for synergies among the business units. And so with that information, then a strategy can be developed uh, by the business unit. So there's this kind of strategic alignment is necessary for larger companies. Mm -hmm. And what about smaller companies? For a smaller company, if you're just one single business unit, then, uh, then you may also consider your, your market segments to see where you need to put more emphasis. So there is some level of alignment there as well for strategies for, for your market. That would come at the highest level because that would require some synergistic uh, um, uh, attention among the business units in order to achieve a higher level uh, of alignment with the, with the vision of the, of, um, of the group. You also introduced something called the strategy tree in your book. Mm -hmm. Tell us how organizations can use the strategy tree to help align their strategies within the organization. We talk about the vision tree, which is really a tree of all the progress indicators that measure the vision. And uh, because the vision uh, is realized through the existing processes, through the processes uh, operating to provide the results necessary to achieve the vision. So there's, on the one side, you've got the vision tree of indicators, progress indicators. And on the other side, you have to look at strategy tree of what you're going to do in order to create new processes for the future. So one is more about the present, the other one is more about the future. And the strategy tree has really three main um, El main elements or the main branches of the tree are aligning the businesses that you have and supporting the businesses that you have and acquiring new businesses that you need in order to achieve the vision. So then out of the strategies for these three main branches, then you will have some strategic initiatives that, necess that are necessary, which will be on this uh, strategy tree. Talk about the alignment map and how that is an important part of total alignment. 
So now we, we're ready to talk about alignment map because ali the alignment map is basically putting these three things together. The vision in the, at the center, then the vision tree on its left side of all the progress indicators for the present processes, and the strategy tree on the right side. So all the strategic initiatives that you need to implement to create new processes for the future. So you got your vision, present, and the future. That's we call the alignment map. You also talk a little bit about projects and initiatives within organizations, the success of projects and initiatives. Tell us what you think makes a project or an initiative successful. Yeah, obviously a project, the success of a project is if it produces results the intended results. But sometimes intended result comes six months out, nine months out. Uh, so you can't wait until that's happened in order to say if the project is successful or not. It'll be too late to do anything at that point because you've lost all this time. So basically we have to look at a project uh, in three uh, parts before the project starts during the project implementation, and then after the project is finished. Obviously, after the project is finished, it's the result that it has produced. But you can do something about preparation and during the project. And so there are a number of factors to consider. For example, pr preparation would be to have a good plan. You have to have a reason for doing this project, to have some objectives for the project, to have customers' input specifications for the project, to have the right resources, they have the right budget, all of that would be before. And during the project would be to have an, uh, a dynamic project plan uh, with uh, the timelines and uh, deliverables and critical path and so on, really using a project tool to, to manage that project. And then on the month-to-month -month basis, the project has to meet its expectation, to meet on time its expectation. It has to be within budget. The customers should be happy. So there are some criteria of during the project. So if all of these are met, then the likelihood of the project succeeding has increased. It, it, it's not a guarantee, but it has increased. And so we talk about that in the book because the strategy tree should also be turned into a progress indicators. And these progress indicators are the measurement of how the project is proceeding during implementation because it can be turned into an index of measurement. So that uh, the left side of the alignment map are indicators of progress, the KPIs of the company that are aligned. The right side are this sort, sort of uh, initiative indicators uh, in a way that I've explained. So we have two sets of measurement. Now, oftentimes organizations implement too many projects or initiatives to be effective. What are some tips you have for prioritizing projects and initiatives? Yes, you're right. Of, often that happens. And that's why so many initiatives, uh, uh, they don't produce a result that's expected. What we recommend is that once, once you go through this process of strategic process, um, that I've explained earlier, you will arrive at a, a number of initiatives. Now you have to prioritize to use the Pareto rule, pick the top 20% uh, that have 80% impact, uh, and uh, so make sure that these are really high priori priority projects. It's, important, it's more important to have few projects that you do well than many projects that uh, you don't do or you don't have a budget to do it. Can you talk about how you can improve the quality of some of the factors that are included in the right side of the map and the left side of the map? Yes, I think that's very important because um, having an alignment map is necessary, but it's, if it's not good quality, <laughs> you really don't need it. Uh, so quality is important. The left side uh, that has progress indicators, the tips that you can use is, uh, first of all, try to actually calculate, have a formula for each indicator, each KPI, and then try to calculate the status. That will get you to actually look at the data and see where are your data sources. And then look and see if those data sources are reliable. 
uh, if the quality is good in those data sources. So going through that process of actually calculating the status of every indicator on the vision tree will enable you to, to arrive at a better quality indicator. Now, you may have some indicators where you have no data, but it's important, you need it. Uh, so there you have to th really think of data capture and whether the cost of data capture is worth the effort that you put into uh, capturing it. Uh, so that's really uh, a way of, uh, of improving the quality. And then with each indicator, you really need to see how does your vision translate into some goals for the indicator. What level should it be uh, in three years or five years and, and this year? And so that can feed into your um, uh, budgeting process. Uh, so that's, that's exciting. That's the, for the indicators on the left side. For the right side, um, to improve the quality, I would suggest that uh, first you question if your strategy is a good strategy. Because if it's a bad strategy, then uh, whatever you measure is not going to be worth anything. So first of all, that this, it's a good strategy, it's a creative strategy for the market, aligned with the market. Uh, and then uh, the criteria for measuring um, whether you have a dynamic um, project plan that's updated every month, whether it's done on time, the milestones are done on time, whether the customers are still happy, and whether it's within, within budget, those are uh, the input that will go into calculating a number for th that initiative. And so the more objective it is, the higher will be the quality. So you mentioned that it's important to have different indicators of progress on both sides of the map. How do you go about figuring out who should be accountable for those indicators? Well, if the map is a good map, it basically it charts your present and future. It's right there. And the vision, right? Now the next question is what you just asked. Who was going to make it all happen? And so we get into accountability. And so what we've learned uh, is that the left side of the map and the right side, they need different treatment. The indicators on the left side of the map, really because they are related to processes that are already existing in the company, they need to be delegated down to the right level. So, so an indicator on the left side should not stay with the CEO, obviously. Then it should go to one level lo lower and maybe even lower, maybe even, maybe even all the way down in the organization to be assigned to someone who can actually make that number move without talking to the boss or getting permission. That person is right there and can make the decisions. So in a way, you're pushing down decision making and accountability to the lowest appropriate level in the organization for the indicators that are related to existing processes, which is on the left side of the map. The right side of the map is the opposite. Because they're strategic initiatives, creating new processes for the future, then they need to be assigned to the highest appropriate level in the organization because at the higher level, you have a greater scope, you have greater ability to, to make the necessary changes in order for that strategic initiative to be successful. Even though a person at a level lower than that could be capable of managing that project, the higher level will have a greater likelihood of success. So th these are the two learnings that we pass on to you. So you outline four roles in accountability. Tell us what those roles are. Yes, because, because uh, one person is not going to do everything. Uh, Usually, we need people to collaborate. People need to, people to help. For example, if you say who is responsible for sales in an organization, well, obviously, uh, sales is so important. So if you ask that question, and I have to many clients, everybody will raise their hand from CEO down 
to the <laughs> everyone. So I'm responsible for sales. But really, who's accountable for sales? Then, because sales is part of the existing process, then it should go down to the lowest level. Maybe the salesperson is the person who is responsible for sales. So he's accountable for sales. But he's not the only one who can make that sale happen. There are people who collaborate, people who influence. So while he has a role of direct uh, impact on the sales, there are other people who have the role of influence on that sale, which could be marketing, which could be production function. Each of them would have the role of influence. So we've defined actually four roles. One is direct impact. Two is cross-functional influence. And there could be one or more people in that role. Three would be management influence. Like, uh, you're my boss, and I have uh, an indicator as, a, as a direct influence, and you have the management influence. You're not going to do it for me. You're not going to actually do the sales for me, but you can influence me through your uh, training, your mentoring, your accompaniment, and all of that. So management influence. And then there's the fourth role of dotted line cross-functional influence. In matrix organization, that's important. So these are four roles, and they're important, because once you know your role, then you know uh, what decisions you can make, and in what cases you have to wait for someone else to make the decision, and you're just supporting. You also talk about three one-page reports in your book, three one-page reports to help you track progress of your vision. Tell us about those. Well, uh, once once you go through that accountability pro process, which I just mentioned, uh, you will end up having one or more indicators. Usually, people come up with a lot of indicators that either they are directly impacting or influencing, but still they have accountability for them. And so you have, we have several. And we recommend that you really don't need that many, maybe five is the maximum you should have, because then you can't focus. So let's say you have five indicators that you actually are scoring, you're watching closely. And those are your five main things for you as an individual in the organization. And those five main things are aligned with the alignment map, which is aligned with vision and strategy. <laughs> okay? So those five things that's important for you. You need to have information. You need to know, feedback, have feedback. What happened last week? Did I make it? <laughs> Didn't I make it? <laughs> if I made it, fine. How can I make, continue to repeat it? If I didn't make it, uh, fine. It, it, it's OK. You don't want to beat yourself up if you didn't make it. What happened? What caused it? How can we improve it? and have an action plan. Uh, and then we, we implement the action plan, we learn what happened. So that process of dealing with that needs information. Now, information is available in the databases of the company. Every company has got a data warehouse that has a lot of information. The problem is that you've got to go and find just that information that will give you feedback on your on performance on those five indicators. And so we feel that maybe that can actually come to you. Or you could find a way of accessing it very quickly. And then on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, actually get the status of what happened. And then compare that with your goals so that you can that, that could trigger action for you. So that's a one, the first one page report, which we call a focus report, that gives you that. The second one-page report, we've tried to actually make it a little more focused on those indicators where you did very well above your goals and those that you're having a little problem. <laughs> so just those two. So out of the five, maybe there's one that you're doing very well and you want to reflect on what was your learning and what you can do to improve. And those that you haven't done well, how can I action plan? And who do I involve in the action planning process? Because now, that the roles are defined, you know who to involve. Very clear, those who have 
critical influence factor. People who have influence, you invite, in, involve them to come up with an action plan together to solve the problem and then reflect on it and learn. So that's the second one-page report. The third report is really the exceptions of performance that are coming from below you in the organization if you're a manager, and we call the management report. So the three reports really give you a full picture of performance in, for you and organization below you. Can you provide some examples of some elements that are included in each of these reports? In the report, um, basically, your focus report would, would need to have your indicators and how it is aligned with the alignment map so that you, you see a line of sight to how you're contributing to the success of the organizations. It needs to have your indicator itself and then needs to have uh, the weights of importance out of the five which is the most important. Uh, and so you can distribute 100 points among those five and give a weight. Um, it needs to have a status of what happened last week or last month. Uh, it, for each one, you need to have goals, and we recommend three level goals of uh, minimum, uh, below which uh, performance would be a problem. Satisfactory is where you would feel happy, uh, reinforced uh, that you achieved it, and then outstanding, which is a stretch goal. So you need those three goal levels there. Um, you also need to be looking at a trend, whether your data is, is trending upwards or downwards, um, so that's important. So those are the basic uh, elements in the focus report, which then transfers into the feedback and the management report. You also talk about competencies in the book. Talk about how you go about figuring out what the required skills are or the competencies are to get a job done. Many companies have got uh, courses, general courses and specific courses people go through to learn, to become you know, better contributors. And those are good. Uh, in Total Alignment, we want to align it even more, <laughs> focus even more. And how do you do that? Basically, if you have five indicators, which, which comes from the right side and the left side of the alignment map, and you have your role identified on the report, you can be successful if you're competent to do it. If you're not competent, what happens is your boss will have to do it. <laughs> it goes back to him or her, which means that two resources are trying to do the same job. So lack of competency is, uh, is equivalent to a lot of inefficiencies. So how do you assure that you're competent in every one of those? Well, we recommend that you take each indicator and then you see what are the repeatable behaviors that would make that indicator successful. Just sit down for a minute and you, you come up with a few things. If you're in the sales, but repeatable behaviors might be to identify the, your list, your, uh, your prospect list, you know, qualify your prospect list, you know, to identify uh, where to focus, uh, you know, uh, get an appointment and, you know, and go uh, to the appointment and turn that convert into sale. So you identify these are the repeatable behaviors that you need to do uh, with that indicator. Every indicator would have different repeatable behaviors. Now, once you've got that set of the repeatable behaviors identified, then you give it a name and that's the core skill that you need. The, the set of repeatable behaviors are the descriptors of the skill. And so if you really need to do those well in order for you to have the skill. And obviously, the general courses that you go to, they're all very good. Uh, but this, we really focus on uh, improving your competency on the uh, skills needed for your, for your um, scorecard. Then what would be the best way to evaluate a person's skill or competency? There are, there are many ways of uh, evaluating competency. Uh, we've come up with something very simple. 
really intuitive. And what, what we say is that you're competent if you're doing the job with minimum effort and minimum supervision from your boss or an expert. Uh, why? Because that's when delegation works. Because if, you, if you're doing something with minimum effort, minimum supervision of your boss, your boss will be happy <laughs> to delegate that, right? So that's those, these two variables is what we consider to be important. So uh, you ask your quest yourself question when you go through the uh, descriptives of the skill. Um, am I doing this with minimum effort compared to uh, a person doing your job in, the, in your industry? Um, and then do I need constant supervision, frequent supervision, no supervision from my boss? And when you, when you go through that process, then you can find out where you are. And we've given a template in, in the book to, to help you do that. So then you will identify whether you're level one, level two, level three, or level four, which is level four being competent in that skill. Now, how do you get from level one to level four? That is a, a plan for competency improvement. Tell us about the best way to develop a competency improvement plan. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to be aware that competency improvement plan belongs to you. It's not, uh, the responsibility is not the HR department or the training department or your boss. It's yours. I mean, acknowledging, owning the improvement is really important and each person has to do that. Uh, so, uh, that. So that's the first step. Once you've identified that you're, like, say, level two in competency in a particular core skill, now you've got to come up with a plan to go from level two to level four in a reasonably short period of time. Because if it's not, then maybe you, uh, you need to have another job because, because this job needs that level of competency, level four. So you come up with a plan, and that plan uh, will include uh, getting training, it includes getting mentoring from someone, getting accompaniment from someone, it involves uh, acting about what, what you've learned and getting feedback, and so all of that will lead into your competency being improved so that you can do things faster and you can do it without supervision from your boss or an expert. Now this plan, when you develop it, you need to have a conversation with your boss and the role of your boss would be to support you, not to dictate, but to support you, encourage you, and help you to implement your plan. And the HR department's role is also to support, provide the training that you need in the process. In the book, you also talk about how it's important to align your behaviors with the core values of the organization. How do you go about doing that? How is that translated on a day-to-day -day basis? First of all, you agree that's important. Yes. Because we see that that's very important, aligning with core values. Core values are really values that you would never change. I mean, you would never change your core value in order to gain market share. You refuse clients, uh, you change your clients before you change your core values, right? So core values are important, and you want everyone in the organization to, to be congruent with that, to be aligned with that. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, the core values need to be translated into pinpointed behaviors. Because, for example, if you say integrity is our core value, wonderful. What does that mean? What does that mean for a person who is working in a store? What does it mean for, for a cashier in a store? It might mean giving the receipt and the right change, for example. So, so pinpointed behaviors are, need to be defined in order to see what the core value means for the organization. And then uh, everyone would really need to, to reflect and, and try to be aligned with that. You've also laid out a process that organizations can go 
through to help with behavior changes within an organization, both large and small. Can you talk about what some of those steps are? Yeah, basically defining core values, and you don't need too many, maximum five, that these are core. Doesn't mean that other values are not important. It just means that there, there are some core values that you have to consider. First, defining it, that's one step. Then, identifying pinpointed behavior for each of one of those core values would be second. Then, would be to transform yourself as a manager before you try to get that in others. So that's really, in order for you to have really even more authority to even talk about it. And then the last is to try to help others, not in terms of preaching to them, because you'd never want to do that, but in terms of helping, facilitating, talking about it, so that uh, the organization at all the levels uh, is, is uh, aware that these are important uh, behaviors to follow. Now we're going to get into review and the importance of reviewing the results of everything that has been put into place. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Now these team reviews can sometimes be ineffective, uh, but you've laid out some steps in the book to help leaders and teams actually come out with better outcomes for these types of review meetings. Can you tell us about that? <clears throat> well, this is one that I'm very excited about, <laughs> this question. <laughs> because in so many companies, there are so many meetings, too many meetings, with too many people in these meetings, uh, reviewing results. Yeah, I know that you got to review the res what happened last week or last month, but usually what happens is that you, these meetings take place and the boss is sitting there and each person report, reporting to him uh, goes on explaining what happened in his area. This person talks about the sales in this area and goes on and on and on and on and then sits down, the next person gets up and talks about his area or her area and so on until everybody has spoken. First of all, when, when the first person speaks, guess what other people are thinking? They're probably thinking about their own presentation that's going to come next, right? <laughs> and then when the first person finishes his presentation and sits down, what is he thinking? Did well, I do okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. do okay <laughs> or thank God it's <laughs> over. <laughs> I'm over. It's done until next, next week or next month, right. right? Usually a lot of time is spent of these highly paid executives that is really wasted because they, they sit long meetings and then they've, they've just talked about the past and there's not enough time to talk about the future. What are we going to do <laughs> now? So we've actually turned this upside down and instead of that group of people talking about what happened in, uh, for each of the members of the team, let's talk about the results of the of our boss. <laughs> How did he do? Because his results, it's our results. How did he do? Where, we look at the f f focus feedback report. Which ones are better than the satisfactory and which ones are uh, not so well? Okay. And then the next question is, okay, how can we help him together for his result to be better? and come up with an action plan. And so, so therefore, we're spending more time about the future than about the past. Because reviewing the result of one person, five indicators from the past, will take a very short period of time because the data is already there. All the graphs and everything are there. What is actual problem? Pinpoint the problem. What are the causes, the root causes? And then how can we uh, have creative uh, solutions, maybe clear, uh, two alternatives of solutions, and then which one would be best to implement so that we can all together implement to make that indicator to improve. So we call this upward focused 
teams, instead of downward focused teams, it takes shorter period of time, more future oriented, more teamwork uh, in, in the process, and maybe something that's cultural also, upward focused. Uh, it means that we're giving this team a vision of a bigger picture rather than thinking about their own areas, a, a bigger process of which I am a part of. And you do that at all the levels of the organization. It's a tremendous uh, cultural value for, for the company. So this is uh, a review process called team review. That's, you see why I'm so excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> You've also said that teamwork is very important. Collaboration is also very important, obviously, in organizations. What are some steps that you lay out in the book to help an organization and a team with collaboration? <clears throat> you know, many, uh, many books are written about teamwork. It's probably more about teamwork than <laughs> many, many other topics. A lot of books about teamwork and a lot of talks about teamwork. But talking about it is not enough. You really need to have structures in place that would support the intention of teamwork. And, this, and, and I think in the in book, we have put the structure in place. And the structure is that um, when you define for an, a progress indicator, who is the person who drives it? Who are the people who influence it? Then you're identifying a team of three or four or five people. Influence it indispensably. Obviously, everybody influences everything. We're talking about the key people who indispensable influence. So that is already done in the accountability, as we mentioned before. The, the main indicator of direct impact, we call it critical success factor. Of influence, we call it critical influence factor. So you put these together, then all those books about teamwork and collaboration, then they can come to play because now you've got a structure in place for these guys to collaborate and also the results that they get, it's a joint result. So that encourages. And since these people are from different functions, you bring them together and enabling them to come up with an action plan together gradually will dissolve the silos because they don't have to go to the boss and ask permission to do something. They're together solving a problem related to an indicator that's aligned with the map. Tell us a little bit about vertical alignment and how that should be included in the review process. I'm excited about this one too. <laughs> Why? Because when you make a team upward focused, not they're talking about the results of the boss, right? So, that, but the boss needs to know what's happening the next level down, right? But this really shouldn't be done in a team. It can be one-on-one. -on -one. And in a meeting of each manager and the person directly reporting to him or her, uh, needs to have a conversation to see what happened in, uh, in terms of the reports uh, performance and the purpose should not be so much evaluation because the evaluation is already in the report it says it was below minimum or above so that's already there so the purpose is not to make the person feel badly if he has maybe uh, two indicators that below minimum but really the purpose is to help to empower to encourage to find out what action plan do you already have for this so when you come to this review meeting with me and my direct report, when you come to this review meeting with me and we have the report, we know, we know what that is of the performance is, we don't really need so much excuse of what happened as we do a solution. Sure, a solution must be based on what analysis, deep analysis, which maybe you did in your team team review. But the main thing is that you come to this meeting with a solution. Oh, I have this problem. 
and here's the solution. And so then it allows the boss to be more supportive and encouraging and helping to, to, for this action plan to be even better and then you know, empowering the person to implement it. So it changes the whole uh, mode of thinking from evaluation that happens in performance reviews in many companies to actually solving problems and, and um, uh, developing the next level in the organization in just this, uh, this small but very important activity of action planning, of implementing the action, reflecting, and learning. So really the boss becomes an agent of learning uh, in, in the organization through this review, which happen, cascades down the organization. And in this team review, also you talk about competency improvement, which we talked earlier. Okay, this, uh, this skill, you're at level two, and show me your plan for getting to level four. And how can I help you to uh, make this plan work? So it's, it's just a very exciting development that happens of capacities at all the levels. Tell us about the importance of aligning compensation with the scorecard that you outline in the book. Do you think that's important? <laughs> that's the most important. <laughs> that is the most important. Because if you don't align people's compensation with their contribution to the company, then forget about alignment. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Because you can't compensate people for doing things that are not aligned with the alignment map. If, if you do, then you're not serious about alignment. So this is why we say this is very important that what you pay people, you compensate people through bonuses or salaries, especially bonuses, uh, um, because salaries are, might be a little bit difficult to align immediately because you know, people have already signed documents and, and so on. But I think gradually salaries need to be aligned also. But bonuses are easy, easier to do um, because if you have a certain amount of uh, profits and you want to take X, X amount of that and distribute among your people, so my share of that, that it's a piece of pie, right? So that piece of pie, pizza, New York pizza pie, <laughs> but anyway, pizza pie, uh, that needs to be multiplied by what I call a contribution index. This contribution index, it could be between zero and, and 100. Let's say that contribution index might is 80. 80 times that piece of pie, which was maybe $1,000 that I would get at the bonus, multiplied, so I get $800. If my contribution index was, was 100, then I would get all, all of it. So what is this contribution index? This com has two components. One is a performance index, which, is, which comes from the scorecard the five indicators and, and what, I, what I did in the last six months on that. Second would come from effort index. I aligned effort. Things that I've done, but it hasn't really resulted in, in the numbers, but still aligned and it will in the future, like action planning and implementing things or improving my skills. Okay. Uh, now, obviously, you have different weights for these. You can give 80% to performance index and 20% to the aligned effort, or 60, 40, or whatever, depends. But the combination of that would be one index, which contribution index, which should be uh, aligned with uh, the bonus system, definitely. And that will drive the behaviors that are needed for you to be aligned as an individual. And then when you do that with everyone, then really you get full alignment. What are some tips you can provide to leaders about implementing all the factors within the total alignment system that you've outlined in your book? Well, I would uh, 
encourage you to first establish a good scorecard system, indicators. Make sure that those are high quality indicators, high quality initiatives, and that you have hard data. That's, that's the first step. You don't have that, then you don't have to go any further. <laughs> Second would be to have a good information system, to be able to extract from your data warehouse the numbers that are needed to each person in the organization. And then if you have that, then you can move to the third, which is the management process, the team review and vertical review that we talked about. So I would suggest that you give priority to those first two steps before you do the third step. It's not that uh, just doing team review and vertical review would not be helpful because the whole concept is cultural concept. Uh, but uh, you, it, it needs to be based on a solid foundation, which is your data. You, in your final chapter, you talk about how it's important for organizations to look beyond profits to the needs of the society. Tell us more about this. That's the best chapter. <laughs> because, because when you do all of these things, it's, it's kind of reflection. Uh, uh, supposing you do everything and you really actually succeed and you make a lot of money, at some point you're going to say, what was it all about? <laughs> really, what was it all about? I sacrificed so much and sure, the bank account is, uh, is, is better, but then what value have I added? And so it's really a more reflection how your vision itself is aligned with the needs of humanity. Because, because a, a true happiness comes when, when that peace is there, that you, are, you feel that you've really made a contribution, you've done, you've made a difference. And so, uh, so we encourage the leaders to, to be thinking about that alignment of the vision itself with the needs of mankind. And, and uh, We've introduced um, a statement uh, called Prosperity Statement in the book that really comes from the Baha'i writings because the Baha'i faith is such a global perspective uh, that looks at uh, the, the principle of oneness of humankind to be at the foundation of everything uh, in, in, in society. And so we felt that that perspective would be helpful for readers to be thinking, reflecting about what does that mean in terms of what I'm doing and the value I'm adding to human prosperity. And also that's a download, uh, again, our website, uh, totalalignment.com slash PS for prosperity statement, and it's a free download just to give you a, a, an idea of uh, the possibilities for the future. Wow. This was great, Dr. Kadem. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Sardar TV.